Escondido police opened fire on a man who they say was charging them with a crowbar. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Barbara Lee Edwards. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. It happened around 3.30 this morning during a traffic stop. News 8 Shannon Handy has more on this morning's shooting and what a restraining order is revealing about the suspect. That shooting took place in the street just behind me here. Police were on the scene for about nine hours. Now, according to investigators, the suspect had just violated a restraining order, which was filed just three days ago. Anytime an officer uses um, force like this, it's a very serious situation. Several evidence markers were scattered along Washington Avenue near Broadway in Escondido Friday following an officer involved shooting that happened during a traffic stop there around 3.45 a.m. Got out of his car. He had about approximately a three foot crowbar in his hand. He ran toward the officer and the officer uh fired several rounds at the suspect, striking him in the abdomen. The Escondido police officer was alone at the time. He pulled over the suspect, identified as 44-year-old Rosendo Sandoval Quezada, after Quezada's estranged wife called police, saying he had violated a restraining order by showing up in her nearby home. The reporting party informed us of uh, who it was that was in violation of the restraining order, as well as the description of the vehicle. About six minutes later at 345, an officer located that vehicle, did in fact do a traffic stop on the vehicle. Police spokesperson Lieutenant Chris Lick says Quezada exited the car immediately, leaving little time to react. This was a very rapidly evolving incident and a very split second that left very little room for much dialogue. Quezada was treated at the scene before being transported to Palomar for surgery. News 8 obtained a copy of a restraining order, which was filed on Tuesday. In it, his estranged wife wrote that just this past Monday, her husband arrived at her house seemingly on drugs and grabbed and pushed her aggressively. She claims he said, quote, many things are going to happen here and that she feared he would kill her and himself as well. She requested the restraining order for her, quote, safety and well-being. Meanwhile, we've learned Quesada does have two prior criminal cases on his record. As for the shooting, per protocol, it's being investigated to determine if the proper force was used. We're canvassing for witnesses. I know we have at least one. The officer involved in this morning's shooting has been on the force for four years. He was not injured. Back to you. Thank you, Shannon. Community activists are condemning a controversial use of force arrest made by Carlsbad police that was caught on camera. And we'd like to warn you that some of you may find this video disturbing. It happened June 11th. That's last Thursday. 911 dispatchers got a call about a person face down on the sidewalk. Medics arrived and were trying to treat Marcel Cox Harshaw. But the North County Civil Liberties Coalition says officers who came to the scene made things worse. They say officers made no attempt to de-escalate the situation and they are demanding change and accountability. We've been seeing this all over the nation and we're saying no more. We're here to say that we want de-escalation policies. Hey, take a step back. Carlsbad police say they understand that ongoing officer training is crucial for effective community policing. They also provided News 8 with a list of de-escalation methods that officers have been trained on since December of 2015. In Chula Vista, a man was taken into custody today after a few businesses reported someone spitting on people. Officers say when they found the man, they realized that he was dealing with some mental health issues. A member of the PERT unit, or Psychiatric Emergency Response Team, was called to the scene and the man was then taken to a hospital for treatment. Police say no use of force was involved. Several new racial justice and law enforcement realignment policies will be presented before the Board of Supervisors for approval next week. News 8's Alicia Summers joins us now from downtown with more on the initiatives drafted by County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. The proposed initiatives include everything from more oversight of the sheriff's office to establishing another team other than a PERT team to respond to nonviolent mental health calls so law enforcement officers don't have to. The calls for a change that we're making are not new. County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher and, and local black leaders gathered in front of the county building on this Juneteenth. We are not satisfied. We will not be appeased with small concessions. That is what we call it. And we will not be fooled by the system that we live in. And this system continues to be a racist system. They say now is the time to tackle law enforcement issues and establish more racial justice in the county. Our community has been crying out for this change for decades and decades.
Fletcher has drafted three new initiatives. The first policy includes having more oversight of the county's sheriff's office by strengthening the citizens law enforcement review board. And we need to increase their funding to ensure that they have the investigators and the staffing they need to fulfill the mission and charge of true independent citizen led oversight. The second initiative is to start an office of equity and racial justice for the county. This office will involve communities of color in setting policies and budget priorities, secure funding and administer restorative justice programs, work to dismantle systematic barriers that present obstacles based on race. And the final initiative is to launch mobile crisis response teams without requesting sheriff's deputies or police officers to be first on scene. So people will have another number to call for help besides 911. The fact is law enforcement is not the appropriate response to someone experiencing a mental health or substance use crisis. This initiative hits close to home for Ellen Nash, who says she's had to call 911 on her mentally challenged brother. And the only option we ever had was PERT. Call PERT. Call PERT. I am excited today that we will have other options for our mentally challenged relatives. The Board of Supervisors will vote on each individual policy. It doesn't come as a package deal during their next scheduled meeting, which is Tuesday, June 23rd. Back to you. San Diegans celebrated Juneteenth in a big way this year. June 19th, 1865 marks the day when all slaves in America were finally free. To honor the historic occasion, there were rallies, caravans, and a sit-in. News 8's Heather Hope joins us live from an event at Balboa Park. Heather. Yes, there's been a large outpouring of attendance and awareness. Just check out the crowd near the World Beat Center here in Balboa Park. All for today's sing-along and sit-in taking place now. Before this week, Juneteenth was not widely celebrated in America or in San Diego County, and that changed today. Honking in honor of Juneteenth, cars cruise through historic 3rd Avenue of Chula Vista after first meeting at Southwestern College. I couldn't just sit at home. This had to be celebrated. Widely celebrated for the first time for many in America, Juneteenth or June 19th, marking that day in 1865 where all black slaves were finally free. This is important to celebrate because if one person isn't free, none of us are free. Participants in this Juneteenth car caravan decorated their vehicles with balloons and Black Lives Matter signs. This woman wrote a marker largely in Langston Hughes' poem, Oh, Let America Be America Again. Everybody cares about each other, and we're trying to support each other. A momentous day for 11-year-old Zachariah and his guardian, Diane Edwards. It's important for people who look like me to show up. From celebrating in Washington, D.C. with a rally. Not emancipation, obviously a different day, but just recognizing the importance of what black people have done in this country. To in Fort Worth, Texas, where 93-year-old Opal Lee walks 2.5 miles to symbolize the 2.5 years it took for slaves in Texas to know they were free. We shall go a day that brings Angie Stewart to tears. We need to respect that pain. I can't imagine having that many years in slavery and then segregation and then this in 2020. How to celebrate. You know, I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. And there are a number of organizations. Kim Folsom, a San Diegan serial tech entrepreneur, says honoring Juneteenth goes beyond getting a day off. If we don't go through and make some significant economic changes to provide you know, liberty and freedom. We're going to do this again. I mean, we keep repeating the cycle over and over again. In Balboa Park, artists for Black Lives held a sit in, sing in for Juneteenth, making voices heard with talents standing in solidarity for true freedom for all. More people continue to come out here near the World Beat Center in Balboa Park. And the celebrations for Juneteenth don't end today. There will be another one starting at 10 a.m. held with the NAACP North County Branch. Barbara Lee and Carlo. All right, Heather, thank you. Today, the U.S. Navy upheld the firing of Captain Brett Crozier, who urged faster action to protect his crew on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier during a coronavirus outbreak. At that time, I felt that the facts did not justify relief based on the narrow scope. Again, had I known then what I know today, I'd be I would have relieved them back then. 
An initial investigation into the outbreak led to a recommendation that Captain Crozier be reinstated. But during a second broader investigation, officials say they found that Captain Crozier did not do enough to stop the spread of the virus among the crew. This isn't about the email and it's not about the leak. And I go back to my comments about fearless communications up the chain of command. I need, we need commanders to, to, to communicate um, uh, up the chain of command. During the outbreak, more than 1,100 sailors tested positive for COVID-19 and one died. For the second straight day, the county hit one of its 13 triggers that could lead to a slowdown in efforts to reopen the economy. The county is reporting seven community outbreaks in the last seven days. That's at that trigger limit. 258 new cases of COVID-19 are being reported out of more than 10,500 tests. The most tests ever reported in a single day. It's a positive rate of just 2.4%, just below the rolling average of 2.6%. The total number of tests is now at 10,350 of cases, rather, excuse me, nearly 7,900 have recovered. One new death brings the total to 332. Facebook launches a new effort to help educate voters. That's still ahead tonight. Plus, Texas high school seniors get a surprise graduation gift from a couple they don't even know. And summer is literally knocking on the door here in San Diego, but the marine layer, is it going to spoil it for us tomorrow? I'm meteorologist Sean Stiles. We'll take a look at your beginning of summer forecast coming up. The San Diego Zoo and Safari Park are about to reopen to the general public. Good evening, everyone. I'm Carrie Lane. We'll tell you the safety measures that are being put in place to keep you all safe.